watching the video just a minute ago, I stood back there and, and, and tears were coming to my eyes. Um, that's my passion right there, folks. That's what the Lord called me to do, is to reach these guys for Him. And I'll share more about that in just a minute. Uh, my wife, is she back there still? Yeah. My wife, Tammy, and uh, we've been married for 16 years. It'll be 16 years next month. And um, in the back, we have six-year-old Summer. We have four-year-old Seth, soon to be five. We have two-year-old Samuel. We have one-year-old Sydney. And she's holding three-month-old Sawyer. <laughs> But uh, God is good, folks. We we were in Sam's the other day, and we buy bi diapers in bulk. And uh, <laughs> we were in Sam's the other day, and uh, we were buying diapers and everything, and loading the carts up. And we had all the kids dragging around. Had two buggies, and and this uh, older couple walks by and said, "What beautiful grandchildren! Do y'all keep them all the time?" <laughs> My wife got in the flesh real quick, but uh, some people say, "Why did you wait so long?" Well, it's it was God's timing. Um, we tried for a number of years to have children; we were unable to. But uh, God has answered our prayers, and again, and again, and again, and again. And uh, so now I'm like, "Whoa!" Wait a minute. But uh, I want to thank Brother Marty for having me up and. Uh, you know, I, it's got to be hard for a Florida trooper to allow a Georgia trooper in. And, and, I, and I say this, you know, the only thing better than a Florida trooper is a Georgia trooper. And, and I'm still waiting on that salute. But, uh, nah, I love you, Brother Marty. But uh, it, it's a joy to be here. But uh, I started in law enforcement in 1994 with the Houston County. They, it's spelled Houston. Uh, they pronounce it Houston. Been a lot of arguments on the side of the road telling people call the Houston County State Court. No, Houston. No, Houston. But anyway, I started with the Houston County Sheriff's Office in 1994 and uh, served there through 2001 and loved my time as a sheriff's deputy. But I'd always had this hankering, this desire to drive one of those blue and gray state patrol cars. And I think it came from a time when we were on the interstate. I was a little fella and my dad was driving and uh, I thought my dad drove fast and I, I like driving fast and uh, and uh, I, I thought he was driving fast and we're going down the interstate and all of a sudden this car I mean just comes by just sucks the pain off the car it's going so fast and it says state trooper on the side and I said I want to do that one day and uh, but in 2001 God opened that door and I got to go to a trooper school and become a Georgia State Trooper. And I thought, this is where I want to retire from one day. I do not want to do anything else. This is me. This fits me. This is my comfort zone. I love it. But around 2006, God began moving on me in a big way. And I'll share a little bit more about that later on. But uh, and in 2007, it all came to a head. Uh, he had made it very clear what he wanted me to do. And there was a lot of preparation that led up to this point. But in 2007, I resigned from the State Patrol, and we started Simple Message Ministries. And uh, at the time, uh, we went on the road cold turkey. I mean, we just we hit the road, and uh, we were teaming up with churches that were having a Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. I would come in and speak to these guys. And, and uh, because I'm telling you now, Brother Marty can testify this. Everybody that, that has worn a badge, you can testify this. Law enforcement is a different culture. It's a different culture. If you don't understand it, if you haven't been there, it's hard to penetrate that culture. It's like a missionary going to a foreign field. If they don't know and understand that culture, if they don't speak the language, it's hard for them to get anywhere with that ministry. And I can see how God led me through my career, being a, a sheriff's deputy and a state trooper, uh, preparing me and teaching me, getting me ready for this one thing, this one task that He wants me to do. He hadn't called me to pastor. Lord help you, brother. I just, I just, I can't do it. <laughs> but he's called me to be an evangelist. He's called me to be a missionary, to reach these guys for him. And uh, so 2007, we started traveling. And like I said, we we're going to churches that were having law enforcement appreciation days. And um, also, we would go into um, uh, these departments at Shift Change. I found out if you show up at Shift Change, don't call the higher-ups and ask for permission. You get shot down quick. But just show up at Shift Change. Find out when Shift Change is, normally around 5 or 6 o'clock. Find that side door where the guys are going in. Hey, brother, I'm a former Georgia trooper. I got a, a case of Bibles here for y'all, cops' Bibles. Hey, man, come on in. And they take me in, introduce me to the shift commander. And almost every time, almost every time, I can just think of just maybe just twice, two or three times where it didn't work. I'll go in, meet the shift commander. 
they have a, a podium set up where they do their briefing. Hey, come on, tell us what you do. Tell us who you are. And now in that setting, I can't go very deep and uh, preach a message. But what I do is I tell them, hey, I want you to know, guys, I've been there. And I want you to know, guys, this ministry is for you. And, and we care about you. We've got these Bibles. Would you take one? I'm going to leave them right here. We're not going to force them on you. Would you take one on your way out? And by the way, we have our Bibles over there. If you want to take one, please do. But the, the catch is, if you take one, you have to give it to a police officer. All right? And, um, but we give them these Bibles. And then it's our goal to sign them up to be a part of our ministry. And by signing up, we get their email address, and we send them what's called the Daily Armor. And it's a devotional that I write just for law enforcement. And we take the Word of God, we'll take a portion of Scripture, we'll relate it to their job. We'll use illustrations that, that speak to them. And this thing has far exceeded, we, Tammy and I were talking last night, has far exceeded any hope or expectation I had. Do uh, we have any officers in here that are signed up? Okay, I had several come by last night at the table. Actually, I had two in particular came by the table. And I said, Brian, I saw in your devotional where you're going to be here. I had to come see you. And then I had another deputy come by. Big guy. I mean, you shake his hand, your hand just kind of disappeared. And then I'll tell my wife about this. Big guy. And uh, he, he was the one with the thick goatee. You saw him. Well, anyway, he came up to me. He said, he said Brian, he said, uh, I want you to know, I think he's, he's fixing to have heart surgery. He said, I'm fixing to have heart surgery, and it's hard, it was hard for me to get here. He said, well, I told my wife, I, I saw in your devotion that you're going to be here. And I, gotta, so I, I said, i got to go see Brian. And the Lord is just working in these guys' lives. And all it is is someone just taking the step of obedience and just letting God use them as a tool to speak into their lives, to share the Word of God with them. Hey, come alongside. Hey, guys, we love you. And we show these guys that we do love them. And we want to share God's Word with them. We want to disciple them. And we want those that aren't saved, we want to lead them into a relationship with Christ and help them to grow in that relationship. So God has just poured out His blessings on this ministry in a great way. And so we travel full-time for four and a half years, living in a travel trailer. <laughs> and uh, when I say living in it, we lived in it uh, full-time. We, we sold our home. That's all we had. And... Um, but uh, it's a long story. I won't go into this right now. But God has provided us a home to live in, to have a home base. When we found out Sawyer was on the way and uh, he provided that, uh, if I had time, I'd do that. I tell you, God is awesome, folks. God is awesome. He provided that house for us to live in. So now, um, uh, and he also provided his motor home. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we sold the, the truck that we had and because uh, it was just getting to the point we're tra trying to travel with five kids in a truck. It was just uh, not working very well. But um, uh, we began praying about a motorhome. I wasn't going to share this part, but you mentioned it, and I, I'm going to share this. Um, we began praying about a motorhome, and we thought, well, this would probably be the best tool for us to use to be able to continue to travel some. Uh, the family, we've, we've got the home. The family can stay back some. They don't have to go, but there's times when they do want to go, and they can go with us. We started praying about a motorhome, and... Uh, we prayed, it was something like this. Tammy and I will pray about this together every night. Lord, if we don't know what the future holds for this ministry, but you do, and if a motorhome would fit into the, the plan for your ministry, we pray that you provide one. Well, we didn't know it, but uh, there was another couple that was praying, <laughs> that had a motorhome, that was praying about what to do with that motorhome and was praying about giving it to our ministry. They didn't know we were praying for one. We didn't know they were praying to give away one. Right before Christmas, um, we got this huge Christmas tree. And the uh, first year we were able to have a Christmas tree in a number of years. And uh, so my wife picks out this big mammoth tree. I mean, I talked her down to a nine-foot tree. <laughs> <laughs> she went to these 12-foot monsters. I said, it won't fit in the house. It won't go. Come over here. So I'm trying to talk her down to these six and seven footers. So we negotiated and we came up with a nine foot. It was touching the ceiling when we set it up. But anyway, I didn't have enough Christmas lights. So I had to go all the way back to town, about a 25 minute run back to town to get Christmas lights. And I, I go into Lowe's. I'm tired and the Lowe's, they're about to close. And, and um, I went in there and I'm, I'm trying to get everything I need. And an employee brings this gentleman. Uh, down the same aisle where I was at and brings him past me and, and showing him something I, from here to those doors from me and showing him something he was looking for. And uh, 
I looked up and I recognized this man, but he's just an acquaintance. He's not really a close friend. And I started not to even speak to him. And I said, but the Holy Spirit said, no, you go over there and say hey to him. So I, all right. so I went over there and I said, hey, how you doing? And I shared with Brother Marty. When he turned around, the look on his face was like, he was in shock. And I didn't understand why he was so surprised, but he had been praying about giving that motorhome to us. We live in a town of a population roughly 70,000, I think. Plus, we've got two lows, we've got multiple others, everything you can want. God brought us to that store at the same time to the same aisle for this one purpose. And uh, to make a long story short, two days later, um, he had taken the motorhome by, put new, brand new tires on it, and brought it over to our house and said, it's y'all's. God is awesome. Uh, give, give him the glory. He is, he is wonderful. But uh, so now we, um, I do a lot of things on the weekends. Um, we go to these police officer, officer funerals. In fact, we, we came up from Melbourne. We've been gone for a little old week. The kids are, are used to that house. They want to get back to that house. They're tired of this motorhome. But uh, we were in Mississippi two weeks ago, then came home for a few days, and we went down to Melbourne, Florida, where Barbara Pill, a, a sheriff's deputy, and down there was murdered in line of duty, shot on a traffic stop. And we went down there, and to God's glory, we gave away about 800 Bibles to the police officers in that area down there. And uh, we're just rejoicing over that and uh, praying that we're going to see fruit in heaven. We're going to see souls in heaven because it's just these steps of obedience that were taken. But uh, that's who we are. That's what we do. And um, I want to encourage you, you can go to our website. My brother Marty said it's um, reachingcops.com. It'll tell you a little bit more information about our ministry. And uh, if you want to sign up to be a part of the Daily Armor, you can subscribe right there online and you can receive that. Uh, I used to send it out five days a week, but uh, <laughs> with every child that comes along, I tell you, my time is uh, dwindling by the, by the second. And uh, we're, now we're down about two days a week. We send that about two, two to three days a week. And I find that, that that's actually better. I was, we found that we we're probably overwhelming some people and sending them out sending so many of them out but these guys love to get these devotionals so uh, be praying be praying that uh, we can reach these guys for Christ so and let me help you understand why it's so important to reach these guys and brother Marty he, he alluded to this to some of the things that they go through police officers <clears throat> they are regarded as in Romans 13 4 as God's ministers to us for good. That, boom, that automatically puts them in a separate category immediately. They're in a totally separate category. They are God's ministers to us for good. And it's been said, and I've got this on our website also, that police officers are the barbed wire that separate the sheep from the wolves. As they carry out this God-ordained role in, in being that minister and standing in the gap between good and evil, as they carry out that God-ordained role, folks, it takes an awful task on them, an awful, awful, awful effect on them, it, it, awful toll on them. And I wish I could adequately describe uh, some of the things that they, they, they endure, but I was reading a book um, here recently that, that really shed some light on it, helped me understand it. And this guy, he's, his name is Kevin Gilmore. Have you heard of him, Brother Marty? He's a retired Tucson, Arizona police officer. And he went on to get his Ph.D. And now he specializes in, in law enforcement psychology. And this guy is really sounding the alarm for what the modern-day police officer faces out there and the effect that it's having on them. And he talks about the psychological changes that take place in a police officer without them realizing. And talks about how they become hardened and, and desensitized to, to, the, uh, to the world, basically, and how they view people. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Who in here has been a police officer? Okay, all right. I use you as an example. You don't mind, do you? <laughs> well, I, I just, you just have to answer a quick question, but the, I want you to answer it honestly. Don't I worry about... I was a police officer. I was a correctional officer. Okay, well, it's it probably not going to make any difference. Okay. It's probably not going to make any difference. Um, just answer it honestly, okay? Whatever The first thing that comes to your mind, okay? When I say um, who has not been... A, you haven't been a police officer, have you? Okay, I'm just going to ask you a quick question. It's okay. Um, when I say Cub Scout leader, what type of person comes to your mind? A wimp. 
a wimp. Okay. Okay. All right. If we have any Cub Scout leaders in here, hey, no, no offense. I, I'm, just, I'm gonna make it a point here in just a minute. Um, maybe a couple other words. Um, what, 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 what type of character would you think this person had? A, a gentle character, a uh, very um, understanding, mm -hmm. sweet, sweet, mm -hmm. great with it. You know, really connects with the kids. Connects with kids. That's good. That, that's normal. All right. I've been a scout leader too. Oh, have you? <laughs> Bro, what came to your mind? Be honest. Leader. A leader? That's what you've been out of law enforcement a long time. Since yesterday. Oh. Huh? That's police officer for thirty years. As soon as you asked the question, child molester came to mind. Yeah. Almost every police officer in here. That's what came to your mind. That's, that is just an example of how doing this job can change your whole world view. How you view people. How it, it limits your ability to be able to trust people. And to serve as a pastor and to be in the ministry. Uh, God has... I'm sure it helped our Brother Marty to, to overcome these things, and, and he's helped me to overcome these things being in the ministry. And the longer that you're away from it, the more that you can break down, that God can break down these barriers that, that, that have been built up in your life. But that's just one example, folks. They're God's ministers to us for good, and they pay a price to do that. When you ride through your community, you're probably noticing, those of you who are not in law enforcement, you're probably noticing, it's a pretty day out there. Boy, the mountains look good today. Hey, the trees are, they're going to be blooming before long. And, you know, you're noticing these things. I've, I've got to get some things at the grocery store. But when a police officer rides through his community, reminders are coming back. It may be a, a, just a, a little uh, scar on this tree over here. He remembers that, that's a fatality that he worked, where, where someone died. He rides by this certain house. He remembers there was a violent domestic right there. A lady was really hurt bad right there. He's remembering all these things. There are certain things that, that are trapped in your head. You'll never get out. There are certain sounds, certain smells that are in your mind that you can never forget. They pay a heavy price to be that God's minister to us. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for these guys. But law enforcement is also a... a a rewarding career, a fun career. And, and I think most of us got in it. If we, you know, think back to our younger days, why do we get in it? It was probably adrenaline. <laughs> Man, we love adrenaline. At least we did it one time. You know, the, the longer you serve in it, the older you get, the more you realize adrenaline equals paperwork. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, adrenaline, yeah, it used to be fun, but there's a price to pay for that. But, um, you know, I think of some, some of the adrenaline rushes, and I could talk about this all day, and I've got to get the mess, to the message. That's the most important part. But I think of some, some of the adrenaline rushes. Um, I, I had, as a sheriff's deputy, to me, the ultimate rush was a no-knock search warrant. Man, I love a no-knock warrant. Woo! There's dope in the house. Judge says, go get them, boys. You don't have to knock. Make your way in. And you ram the door and you run into the unknown. Man, that is fun. And we had this old hoopty van at the sheriff's office. I mean, we made it look like a gangster vehicle because we wanted to fit in. And we drive in these neighborhoods. We knew the house. We already had all the intel on the house. We, we knew, you know, everything we could possibly know about this house. And so we're riding in the neighborhood and nobody's looking twice at us. We, we look like we belong in this neighborhood. But the windows were blacked out. You, they just didn't know what was inside. <laughs> inside was a fully armed, fully suited up SWAT team. And we come riding in this neighborhood and we pull up just like we're going to visit them. But when that door opens, it's on. And uh, we would rush in there. Woo! I mean, that's good stuff. But then uh, I went to trooper school. And, uh, or tor torture school. And I, I know y'all probably sit around and hold hands and sing all day in, in Florida. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> I love you, brother. You know, you know why Florida's at the end of the road, don't you? Because we had to fix everything, George. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> but uh, trooper school was, man, whew, that was rough. And I, mean, I think I still have nightmares about trooper school. But anyway, there was one part of trooper school where we did driving, driving training. I think we spent three weeks on driving. And part of the what they teach you is the pit maneuver. And uh, looking here now, when they taught me the pit maneuver, I said, look, uh, 
from that point on, I had one thing on my mind. Get me out of this school so I can go pit somebody. I mean, a pit maneuver, let me explain what that is. Pit maneuver is when you're in a chase, you can basically end the chase where you want to, how you want to end it. Uh, you, you simply get up next to the, to the violator, you match the corner of your front bumper to the corner of his rear bumper, and you give him a push, and it sends him spinning. And uh, man, I want to tell you now, that is some good stuff. Woo! That is an adrenaline rush. So I get out of trooper school, and they don't tell you until the day before you, you graduate where you're going to be assigned to. So the day before graduation, they're, they're handing out assignments, they're calling out badge numbers, and they get to mine, 406. And they say, 406, Atlanta. Like, oh. <laughs> Who wants to go to Atlanta? I, it's probably, I know Miami is twice as bad, but it's probably, you know, no, no trooper wants to go to Miami, I'm sure. And no trooper wants to go to Atlanta. But they sent me to Atlanta. So I thought, well, the good thing is somebody in Atlanta, Georgia is going to get pitted. Hey, somebody's going to get pitted. So they send me up there, and I begin working. I'm stopping all these cars, stopping all these cars, and I'm waiting on that one that's going to run from me so I can pit him. I just, I love doing it. And, but nobody runs. This is Atlanta, Georgia. Everybody's supposed to run from the police up here. <laughs> but nobody would run. For 13 months, I stayed up there stopping all these cars, and nobody would run. I'm thinking, man, you know, well, finally... They transferred me back home. After 13 months, they said, all right, 406, you can go home now. So they sent me home to my home territory, and I began working around Perry, Georgia. So I'm thinking, all right, this is my territory. I know where these thugs work, live, operate. I'm going to find somebody to run. So I start working in all these areas. Nobody would run. I mean, <laughs> I got in chase after chase as a deputy. Nobody would run. Till one day, I think it was a Saturday morning, my wife... <laughs> She'll remember this. She got a phone call early in the morning about this. But um, it was on a Saturday morning, and I had drifted off out into the, away from the interstate and gotten out into, the, into a rural area, just out. And uh, my uh, dispatcher called me. He said, Perry, 406. Uh, be advised, Dooley County Sheriff's Office is in a chase. They're northbound I-75, and they're requesting a trooper. And I thought, woo! All right, here's my chance. <laughs> But the problem was, I was 30 miles by now, 30 miles from the interstate. They're over here. I mean, we're almost side by side, but there's a big gap. They're going north, so I can't come over here and catch, catch them because by the time I get over there, they're long gone. So I had to try to meet them, and my only hope to do that was going up to Byron, Georgia, on Highway 49 to meet them there at the interstate. So I'm giving that Crown Vic, I mean, all this ah! just as fast as I think. Get out of my way. I, got, I had to go pit somebody. So I'm, I'm, they're calling out mile marker after mile marker. 406 B advisor now at the mile marker 140, still northbound. I'm, I'm timing them on my, on my clock right here. I'm thinking, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Oh, come on, get out of my way here. And uh, finally, about two miles south of Byron, they give me one more update. 406 B advised they're exiting off in Byron on Highway 49 and going south. Ooh. He passed all these exits. Why are the violators? They're so... No, they're, anyway... <laughs> He passed all these exits, and now he's getting off on my exit. I thought, oh, I got you now. So anyway, I pull over to the meeting, and I'm waiting on him. To, I see him coming through town, running red lights. I see all the blue lights behind him. And I think, oh, yeah, come to me, man. Come to me. Yeah. And when you piss somebody, I don't know what it's like in Florida, but you've got to have bragging rights. I mean, depending on what kind of car that you pit. I'm, yeah, I pitted a Mustang last week. Oh, really? Yeah, well, I got to come here, man. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, we're doing 100. Well, I was doing 110. Really? Yeah. You know, so you got to have bragging rights. And I'm sitting there watching. Woo, 406. We have some bragging rights today. All right, what, what do we got here? And I can see him coming through town. And I'm watching. I'm watching. He's getting closer and closer. A Ford Escort. <laughs> Minus the, the bragging rights, I did get to do my, my pit maneuver and uh, everything turned out well. Nobody got hurt. Violator went to jail. Good stuff. But uh, that's part of being a police officer. There's exciting times like that. But like I said, there's also a heavy price to pay. And we need to remember these guys. When you see a police officer, remember, hey, that, don't think about what you've seen on TV or, on, or in the media. Think, that's God's minister to me for good. Because I promise you, there are close to a million police officers in this country. And what you see on the, the news is not an accurate representation of our police officers in, in today's country. By and large, they are some good people that are trying hard to do a good job to serve you. It, 
is wired within them. I believe God wires in, wires in them. It's a calling. They can't imagine doing anything else. They're just wired to do this. To run to your aid. To risk their life for you. So let's be praying for them. But let's get to the most important part of the service. That's opening God's Word. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14, please. Matthew chapter 14 this morning. And uh, Brother Marty, he, we were on the phone the other day, and um, he was sharing with me some things that were going on in, uh, in the church and uh, some things that, uh, that y'all have been learning lately. And it, something clicked in our conversation that um, brought my mind immediately to this message. And I want to talk to you this morning about stepping out of the boat. Stepping out of the boat. And before we get started, I want to go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to be here this morning. And Lord, as we open your word now, God, the most important part of any service, God, I pray that our hearts will be in tune with yours, our ears will be open, our spirits will be yielded to you. God, I pray that you'd have your perfect way in our lives today, God. Lord, if there's a step of faith that you want us to take, Father, I pray that you make that clear, God. I pray that you get us in the position where we could take that step to follow you, Lord, and, and whatever it is that you want us to do. Father, I pray that you and you alone will be richly glorified in this service. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to open up by asking you a question. What have you done lately in your service to the Lord that required a step of faith? Now, I'm not talking about something that you did five years ago, ten years ago. What have you done lately in your service to the Lord that required a step of faith? Because as we grow higher, and God wants us to continue to grow higher, to know Him more deeply, to, to know Him more intimately, as we grow in our faith, uh, He wants us to have that dependence upon Him, that trust that's in Him. And as we grow, and if we believe Hebrews eleven six, which says, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. If we believe that, then we can reasonably expect to have to take steps of faith from time to time in our walk with Christ. And when I say taking steps of faith, I want you to be careful as we go into this message. Be careful to not get some grand, huge thing in your mind, like stepping away from the job and starting some ministry. All right, it may be God's calling you to do that. I don't know, but don't be locked into thinking some thinking of something huge. It may be something like sharing your faith with someone in particular. It may be something, uh, uh, an area of service within the church that God wants you to be involved in. It may be something, some type of outreach here in Blairsville that God wants you to be involved in. Whatever it is, whatever it is I pray that you'll be yielded to the Spirit of God as He works in your heart today. And uh, so I want to call your attention to verses 22 through, through 31. That's a very familiar portion of Scripture, but I want you to take a, a fresh look at it this morning. I can tell my boys have been playing with my glasses. <laughs> Chapter 14, verses 22 through 31. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea and tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, as we go into this portion of Scripture here, I want you to keep in mind the disciples have just witnessed Jesus feed the 5,000. They've just seen this incredible miracle. And now in verse 22, he tells them to get into the boat and go to the other side. He tells them to leave. And they, they did what they were told. They responded to Jesus is directed by saying, Okay, Lord, we're going to obey you. We're going to go. They did what they were told. And that's basically what, what you and I did at salvation. 
God presented us uh, His Son, Jesus Christ, said this is the only way to heaven. You accept Him by faith. That's your only hope of being saved. That's your only hope of, of being forgiven of your sins. We, we accept Christ as our Savior. We're now in God's boat. If you're a child of God, let's say you are in God's boat. But we also have to remember that is the most basic form of obedience. That's our first step of obedience and receiving Christ as our Savior. The point I want, want to make is this. The opportunities come along for us to do more. For us to grow in our faith. To not just stay back here, but to say, Lord, I trust you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. I want to follow you. I want to trust you. I want to do things for you. I want to be a tool in your hand. And I'm going to trust you to do these things through me. And the first point I want to make is, is the, uh, the comfort that's inside the boat. And first there's the comfort of obedience. The comfort of obedience. Now, Put yourself in the, in the disciples' shoes. Now, they have just witnessed this miracle. They, they had just seen Jesus with just a little bit of food. He has fed the 5,000, and they're in awe. Can you, can you just imagine being there, witnessing Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God, perform this incredible miracle? They've seen Jesus do this, so they're in awe. It only stands reason they had to have been incredibly reluctant to leave His presence. I, I, Lord, I'm going to hold on to your feet. I want to be right here. I never want to leave your side. But they told him to get in the boat and go to the other side. And they responded by doing what he told them to do. And when we bring or when we obey, just as the disciples did there, that act of obedience can bring about a certain amount of comfort to us. It can make us comfortable doing that act of obedience. Hebrews 10.25 says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves. We are supposed to come to church. As God's church, we are supposed to assemble together for many reasons. We won't go into that right now. But by coming together or being obedient, coming to church brings a certain amount of comfort. We're told to share our faith, to share Him with others. And as we do that, that alone brings a certain amount of faith. Obedience can bring about Comfort, but familiarity. Listen, being familiar with, with doing these, these certain these certain things can also breed what's it called contentment, and that's what we have to be on guard against. We have to be on guard against being content, against just being comfortable and doing these these small acts of obedience. Now, the disciples see they were in their comfort zone by being in this boat, by doing this one act of obedience. They were doing what they were comfortable doing and like I said already just in coming to church Sunday after Sunday just in living the Christian life and being obedient in these small areas that can lead us into a sense of complacent if we're not careful and prevent us from being alert or being ready for God to bring about those those steps of faith I, I've got this over here I want you to do I know it scares you, but I want you to trust me. Just trust me. Step out and trust me. If we're not careful, complacency can keep us from recognizing those opportunities. We can get on what's basically what's on what's called autopilot. And we're just operating, we're just in the mode, just doing these things, just without even thinking, we're just operating on autopilot. The disciples, they did what they were told, but they weren't looking for opportunities to do more have to guard against complacency. This makes me think back to a time in our lives. Um, I was serving as a trooper. Uh, we had um, just built this beautiful house out in the country. And it was a very, very busy time in our lives. Um, the house was actually was uh, in progress. We are building on that, building that. And we had four acres of land. Had me a brand new John Deere tractor. Whew, love that tractor. Mm. Had me a brand new John Deere tractor. And I'm out there working on the land. And, and I go to work work for eight hours and I come home change clothes real quick get on my tractor or go out there and work on the house whatever I need to do busy 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 now I was serving in my local church I was serving as a deacon at the time uh, I was careful to have my quiet time in the morning I get up and, and read the read, read all right I did that check up check that off my list go on I was careful to be doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing but I had gotten so wrapped up in doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing that I wasn't listening for more. See, I was busy. And it wasn't until one day um, 
I, I was just about to go outside. Actually, I was just about to go on duty uh, as a trooper. I just got my uniform on and had a fall as I was leaving and broke my foot. I call it a freak action. It was just, it was God ordained. Fell and broke my foot. And as soon as I hit the floor, as soon as I got done screaming like a girl, I said, uh, first thing I thought was, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. I knew it was broke as soon as I, I hit the floor. I don't have time for this. I've got to build this house. I've got to work on this land. I've got to go to the job that I love. I've got to do all these things. I, 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 I don't have time for this. Well, we went, Tammy came home from work early, and she took me to the hospital, and, you know, same old routine. Yeah, it's broken. Uh, here, here's a referral to an orthopedic and, uh, for a cast, and, and uh, here's some pain pills, and, and uh, you know, see you. Here's your crutches. So, uh, anyway, I go home, and I had an appointment with an orthopedic for a couple of days after that. This was on Friday, I think, and the appointment was on Monday. Well, I think it was Saturday or, or Sunday, anyway. Uh, I developed a blood clot in my leg as a result of this uh, injury. So now I'm in the hospital. And I was laying in the hospital. I'm thinking, okay, Lord, this is for a reason. You have slowed me down for a reason. And I said, Lord, help me not to waste it. He got my attention. I had, he put a stop to all those things I was doing and said, now you're going to listen to me. He got my attention. And it was during that six-week recovery that God did some incredible things in my life. See, Tammy, now there were some things that we have been praying about. We were praying for a way for her to be able to stay at home uh, uh, full time. We ha weren't able to have children at the time, but we were praying that would somehow happen. We wanted her to be able to stay at home, but we weren't willing to trust God to move in that direction. We weren't willing to take the necessary steps to, move, to sacrifice whatever we had to sacrifice and trust God and do that. Uh, there were some other things, major things we were praying about. I won't go on all that. But it was during this time, the Lord showed me. He said, okay, you've been praying about these things for a long time. Are you willing to take a step in that direction and trust me to bring it to pass? And at the end of the six weeks, I have made a list of goals and priorities uh, completely different from the direction we were heading in. And it wasn't long after that. The house went up for sale, sold my new tractor. <whistles> Boy, I hate to see that thing drive off. And, and, and we, sold all, we did what we had to do to get in the position to be able to let her stay at home. And I didn't realize it at the time, folks. I didn't understand what God was doing. But you see, He was laying the groundwork for things ahead. I didn't see this, this big picture over here. I just saw, you know, day to day, I'm doing my job that I like. I'm building the house that I want. And I'm doing what I want to do. And Lord, I, I'm fitting you in the picture. I'm, I, I'm keeping you first, Lord. You know, and I thought I was doing okay. But God... He began chipping those things away. And it was because of that time when I said, Lord, make me yours again, Lord. I want to be yielded to you. And made those tough decisions and was willing to trust Him and those small steps to start with. And He was laying the foundation, laying the foundation. All right, that's another stepping block. That's another stepping stone. Keep going. Keep trusting me. To the point where He got us ready to step out and start this ministry. But had I not obeyed Him back then, we wouldn't be where we are today. When God presents an opportunity to you, folks, listen. Be attentive to what He's showing you. See, and by being in the boat, folks, and by, by coming to church and by doing those things you're, that you're supposed to, please under, understand me, I'm not trying to belittle that. The disciples, they're in the boat, they're doing what they're told, but it's tough. Hey, they're facing wind. They're facing opposition. It was tough doing what they were doing. They didn't turn back. They, they could have turned back and went, went the other direction. But they didn't. They continued going in the direction God called them to do. And by serving, by staying faithful to Christ and living for Him day by day, it's not easy. And I don't want you to think I'm belittling that, okay? I'm not. But I'm, my point is this. Be attentive. Be tuned in to the Spirit of God. Be looking for those opportunities to do more. Because the opportunities that, that they've come along, folks, and they're different shapes and sizes for all of us. It may be big in man's eyes. It may be little in man's eyes. But nevertheless, a step of faith is a step of faith. That the, uh, the opportunity came along for these disciples. 
The opportunity is now fixing to come for all these disciples. But only one of them is going to take it. Look back in verse 25 with me. With me. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now picture it. it it's between 3 and 6 a.m. They're in this rough weather. It's the fourth watch of the night. It's between 3 and 6 a.m. They're in this rough water. They're tired, maybe even fearful. And now here comes Jesus walking on water. They have just seen him feed the 5,000. Now he's walking on water. Their faith meter should have been pegged out by now. Woo! This is the Son of God. This is, there is nothing he cannot do. It was opportunity for all of them to take a step of faith. But only one of them is going to take it. You know, we have those opportunities. Those opportunities that come along for us all, for our, our faith to explode. As we step out and say, Lord, I, I can't do this. This scares me to death. But Lord, I'm going to trust you. You have to do this. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to take this step and watch you work. And see what He does in your life. See how your faith explodes. Those opportunities come along for all of us. And that takes us to point number two. And that's the call to leave the boat. In verse 28, Peter asked Christ to call him out of the boat. He said, Lord, bid me come. In verse 29, Christ's response was just this. It was, it was hey, well, you got to follow these guidelines right here, or, or you've got to clean this up, clean that up. You've got to do this, 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 before you come out. All he said was, come. Come to me, Peter. Only one said, Lord, bid me come. Lord, ask me to come to you. And he said, come. If you're going to trust me, go ahead and step out of that boat. Trust me. Come to me, Peter. See, Peter, he waited for that word from Christ. He didn't just jump out. He didn't just jump out in the water and say, Woo, I'm going to walk on water because Jesus is walking on water. He waited for Christ to direct him to do that. And that's a, a lesson for all of us. So God gave us this noggin, didn't he? He gave us common sense, didn't he? We need to use that. We need to use our common sense. But at the same time, we need to be on guard against letting human reasoning interfere with a step of faith God's leading us to do. When we stepped out to do this faith, or to start this ministry, we caught a lot of criticism. What are you doing? You've got a family now. You've got, you've got to put food on the table. You, you, you've got to provide for these children. You've got to have insurance. You've got to have all this. What are you doing? We caught a lot of criticism. It didn't, it didn't match up with common sense. It didn't match up with human reasoning. So be on guard against those times. When God tells you to take a step of faith, most of the time, it's not going to reason. It's not going to match up with human reasoning. Be on guard against that as you use your common sense that God gave you. See, God, He knows how to speak to us. He wired you. He knows how to speak individually. He knows Brother Marty intimately. He knows you better than you know yourself, doesn't He, Pastor? He knows how to speak to us in a way that we understand. And how He speaks to you is going to be different from how He speaks to me. Now, ultimately, the Word of God is our final authority. This is how God speaks. But He also speaks through His Holy Spirit. He also speaks through circumstances as He guides us through our life. Now, Peter, he had the Word to come. Christ has told him to come. And, and he responded. But now let's look at his motives. You know, Peter, when I think of Peter, I think of a rookie. <laughs> He's got a big mouth, and he doesn't know when to shut it up, and he's impulsive. He wants to, you know, just, woo -hoo, let's jump out and do this over here, without thinking many times. And Peter, to an extent, he was that way. He, he, he was impulsive. He would say things uh, without thinking it through many times. But usually, his motives were pure. And it's the same, ki same case here. Look in verse 29. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. And listen to these last four words. To go to Jesus. To go to Jesus. See, his motive wasn't, Woohoo! Look at me, I'm walking on water. I can do this, you can't. You look at me, I'm somebody, I'm super spiritual. That, that wasn't his motive. His motive was to go to Jesus. He was fixed on Christ. I want Christ. I want to go to Him. I'm going to walk on water. He's going to enable me. I want to do this to bring Him glory. That was His focus. 
And any step of faith that God leads us to do, folks, whether it's sharing Christ with that neighbor, whether it's, it's being involved in this ministry over here, whatever it is that God leads us to do, listen, our sole motive, our sole motive must be Jesus Christ. Not to be seen of man. Not for man's pat on the back. Not for man's recognition. It's to go to Jesus. It's to glorify Him. To honor Him. And to obey Him. That has to be our sole motive. Peter was fixed on Christ. But we all know that trouble soon came. Look, look with me in verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. See, he... He was looking at Christ, but trouble was coming. And instead of continuing to look to Christ and not looking at these things, all of a sudden he starts looking at what's going on around him. He starts looking at, hey, the criticism. You start listening to that criticism. You start looking at, well, I don't see how this is going to work. And you get your focus off Christ. He starts looking at these waves, and he got his focus off of Christ, and he started to fail. He started to fall, but he called out to the right one. He said, Lord, save me. He reached out to the right one and said, Lord, save me. And that's my little fella right there, buddy. Did you, did you escape? <laughs> did you escape, buddy? This is little Samuel. Yeah, come here, buddy. I can. Huh? I can. Mm -hmm. All right. What are we going to do with you? Huh? Yeah. You, you want to sing? This is my little singer right here. You want to stay with me? You want to preach? <laughs> All right, buddy. You stay up here with me. Where was that? Hey, Lord, he called out to the right one. He said, Lord, save me. And the Lord called out, or the Lord reached out and he, and he called him. He called him. And he pulled him back up. But what did he ask him? Why'd you doubt me, Peter? Peter, you've seen me. Peter, you, you, you understand that I am God the Son. Peter, you've seen the miracles that I've performed. You've seen what I have done in your life. Peter, why did you doubt me? Why did you doubt me, Peter? See, God not only expects our obedience, He deserves it as well. He deserves it. He deserves our trust. You know the old sayings, where God guides, He provides. Where God leads, He feeds. What He orders, He pays for. And folks, these are so true. He provided what Peter needed in his step of faith. In his step of faith, he needed a way to walk on the water. And that's exactly what God provided. He prov now, did, he su did He suspend gravity? You need a diaper change, but <laughs> Did He suspend... <laughs> did He suspend gravity? Did He make the water a hard surface? We don't know. But the point is, he provided what Peter needed for his step of faith. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Don't steal the service now. We're going to give God the glory for this, all right? All right. He provided what, what Peter needed. He will provide for you what you need. If you wait for him, wait for that call to come and trust in him. You want to take over this next point? Okay, what you going to preach on? I want to think about this question. What are you going to do that's going to require a step of faith? What is it that God is maybe bringing to your mind right now that requires a step of faith? Is God leading you to do something in your life? I think back when we started this ministry. This was before you came along. Real little ham, you know that? The time had come for us to step out. Uh, all the preparation had been made. Um, everything was ready to go. Everything was set in place. We had meetings booked. Uh, the camper had been bought. or We were in the process of buying the camper. And, and uh, things, things, we were ready to put this thing in drive and go. And uh, it all came to a point on a Friday morning. It was my last days of Trooper. I had all my gear loaded in the car, Brother Marty. I mean, it was saggy. The bumper was almost touching the ground. Everything the State Patrol had ever issued me was loaded in this car. I had to drive it to Atlanta, turn in the car, turn in everything, and uh, uh, be processed out. Would no longer be a State Trooper. And I'm going to tell you, folks, when I sat down in the car that morning, the butterflies were incredible. And I sat down in the car, and I, I, before I cranked it up, I said, Lord, I am following you, right? <laughs> and... Uh, 
I, I've seen what you've done. I, I know what you've shown me. And Lord, I'm, I'm just going to have to believe you. Crank the car, and the stereo was on a uh, Christian radio station. David Jeremiah was preaching a message. And uh, his point, he was summarizing his points. As the radio came on, he was starting to summarize his points. Tell me, buddy. His points were this. Look back to what God has called you to do. Remember it, and then move forward. See, what I needed right then was just a last bit of encouragement. Just a last bit of affirmation. And I said, God said, I'm going to give you that. I'll give you that. Whatever it is that you need, folks, God will give it to you. And I'm going to summarize the message by this. Hey, listen, be attentive. Be ready. Be tuned in the Spirit of God. Number one, seek His direction with all your heart. He told, in, in Jeremiah, He told the Israelites, you have found me because you did search for me with all your heart. Seek His direction. Seek Him with all your heart. Make Him your all. And then wait on wait until you're sure of his direction. Peter didn't step out of that boat until Christ said, Come. Wait on God's direction. Make sure now if it's something that's blatantly laid out in scripture that we're to do, you don't have to wait. He's already given us the directive. We're told to share our faith. But if it's something else, hey, wait for God's direction. Oh. Then number three, step forward with your focus on Christ and your motives pure. Your motives to seek glory for him. Is that enough? Okay. <laughs> now the message this morning has been primarily to those of us that know Christ. If there's someone here that has never trusted Christ as your Savior, you can do that this morning. You can become a child of God, have those sins washed away, and leave here a child of the King and be ready to take those steps of faith as God presents them to you. Why not trust Him as your Savior today?